In part two of our poetry overview, we'll talk about the importance of sound in poetry. So originally, poetry was an oral tradition, and because of this, the spoken sound of the words in a poem is often instrumental in setting the tone of that poem. Now it's worth noting that in some more modern poetic forms, this is not always the case, but most of the time, this is true. We're going to go over just a few tools and techniques that exist in poetry that can help to evoke certain emotions and reactions through the sound of a poem. One technique is that of assonance. Assonance is the repetition of a particular vowel sound. In English, we have 15 distinct vowel sounds, and each one has its own character or tone color. And this is the same way that a different musical instrument would have its own tone and sound to it. Some vowel sounds require more energy and are more forceful or bright. For example, if we listen to the, the high frequency sound of the letter I. In this example, Christ, they are panes of ice, a vice of knives. Or as Coleridge wrote, in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. In both of these examples, you can hear that sharper, brighter sound coming through the language. Compare this to other vowel sounds that can be more muted, low energy, or sometimes even unpleasant sounding. In this example from E.E. E. Cummings, he uses the short U sound, that uh, uh, uh sound, uh, that almost sounds like we're being lowered down, uh, but in a playful sort of way in this particular example. In just spring, when the world is mud luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee, and Eddie and Bill come running. So we have just, mud, luscious, and running, that sound that repeats itself here. There's many other vowel sounds, each of which has its own different type of character and emotional response. So just listen for these different vowels when you're looking at a poem. The next technique is alliteration. Um, whereas assonance deals with the vowels, alliteration deals with consonant sounds, uh, particularly the repetition of consonant sounds that appear at the beginning of words or syllables. And just like with vowel sounds, consonant sounds each have their own distinct characteristics and can evoke specific emotional responses from us. Consider, for example, consonants that have a more vowel-like sound, such as the letters W or Y. From this example with Wallace Stevens, he writes, It is a red bird that seeks out his choir among the choirs of wind and wet and wing. So with these W sounds and choir, wind, wet, wing, we hear a smoother, more flowing alliteration. Similarly, when we have the sounds of the letters L and R, these are called liquid sounds because when we speak them, it feels like they're flowing around our tongue instead of popping or hissing like other letters. So this example from Tennyson goes, And on a sudden, lo, the level lake and the long glories of the winter moon. So we have lo, level lake, long glories, and it also helps to make it feel like these words are just rolling around and flowing around in your mouth as they come out. A very different sound that we can get in alliteration is the sound of the letter B. This is often a more comic sound because of its um, more popping type of noise that it makes. Uh, for example, Shakespeare likes to use this sound in excess when he wants to make something sound ridiculous. For example, he writes, Whereat, with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast. So once again, there's many other consonant sounds we can talk about, but you get the picture, and whenever you're listening to a poem, just think about what kind of consonant sound you're hearing and how that helps to add to the overall tone of the poem. So now let's talk about onomatopoeia. A uh, fun sounding term here, and it refers to words that sound like their meaning. For example, choo choo, or tick tock, or pop, or fizz. So just the sound the word itself makes 
is the meaning of the word. Uh, we can look at an example here from Alfred Lord Tennyson. The bone of doves in immemorial elms and murmuring of innumerable bees. This word murmur sounds like somebody or the bees doing the murmuring themselves. So this is a great example of onomatopoeia. Now let's talk a little bit about rhyme in poetry. Now poetry does not have to rhyme and there are many great poems out there with no use of rhyme whatsoever. But there are also many wonderful poems that do use rhyming devices to supplement their sound. And we're going to briefly consider four types of rhyme techniques. End rhyme, internal rhyme, off rhyme, and consonants. End rhyme, as the name suggests, is when you have the words at the end of two or more lines rhyming with each other. So for example, we have this example from Lord Byron. There's not a sea the passenger ever pukes in, turns up more dangerous breakers than the ukes in. So here we have this kind of goofy sounding rhyme at the end of this particular couplet, and it helps to really add a punch of humor to the poetic lines that Byron has written here. Compare if we tried to read these without the rhyme, it just wouldn't be as funny sounding. So if we said, there's not a sea the passenger error pukes in, turns up more dangerous breakers than the Black Sea. It just doesn't carry the same type of humorous punch. So that's an example of where an end rhyme does help the poem. Internal rhyme, again, as the name suggests, occurs when rhyming words appear within the line of poetry. It's not just the words at the end of the lines. And our example comes from Edgar Allan Poe, his famous poem, Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. And having that rhyme carrying through that single line of poetry helps to sort of make us feel like we're plodding along through this dreary night. Off rhyme occurs when you have words that almost rhyme with each other, but are slightly off. Maybe the vowel sound is a little off or the consonant sound is just slightly off. It can also be called slant rhyme, near rhyme, or half rhyme. And off rhymes can sometimes provide a sense of dissonance in a poem, uh, make you feel like you're just a little bit off kilter where you are, would otherwise be expecting a full rhyme. Uh, to use one example uh, from this poem from W.B. Yeats, that is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Finally, consonants is quite a bit like off rhyme. Uh, consonants occurs when the vowel sounds in the words change, but the consonants before and after those vowels stay the same. So for example, in this excerpt, let the boy try along this bayonet blade, how cold steel is, and keep with hunger of blood, blue with all malice, like a madman's flash, and thinly drawn with famishing for flesh. So we have blade and blood, where they both begin with the BL and end with the D sound, but our vowel changes. And then we have flash and flesh. Uh, and so again, it's these almost rhyme sounds uh, that still carries a thread through the poem, but is not quite as sing-songy as you would get with a full rhyme. Finally, let's talk quickly about rhyme scheme. Now, sometimes poems will have a set rhyme scheme, and that means a set pattern of rhyme that is going to repeat throughout the poem. And not only individual rhymes, but the pattern of those rhymes can also add to the tone of the poem. And when we talk about rhyme schemes, we usually diagram them or talk about them by assigning a letter to each rhyme sound. So for example, a poem that has rhyme scheme ABAB will have end rhymes that match the first and third lines, the A lines, and a different end rhyme matching the second and third lines. 
So it might be easier to understand that if we look at an example. So we can look at this poem with the pattern A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, D, D. And this is the first stanza of John Keats's famous Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and leithwards had sunk. I'm going to pause for a moment. So we see there we have pains and drains that rhyme. Those are our A lines and drunk and sunk. So those are our B lines. So we have A, B, A, B. Then our rhyme scheme switches and we end up with C, D, D, C, D, D. So the C lines are going to rhyme and then all of the D lines are going to rhyme with each other. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Now this poem is one that is fraught with longing and sadness, and the way the rhyme scheme is set up helps to pull us along through this type of uh, longing emotion and sad emotion. You can compare this to a more comic rhyme scheme, which comes again from Lord Byron. Here we have A, B, A, B, A, B, and then a C, C couplet, which provides a humorous punchline at the very end of the stanza. And this is going to have a bit of a limerick type of sound to it. He was a mortal of the careless kind, with no great love for learning or the learned, who chose to go wherever he had a mind, and never dreamed his lady was concerned. The world as usual, wickedly inclined, to see a kingdom or a house overturned, whispered he had a mistress, some said two, but for domestic quarrels one will do. So just to recap, we talked about assonance, alliteration, onomatopoeia, three kind, sorry, four kinds of rhyme, end, internal, off, and consonants, and we talked briefly about rhyme scheme.